and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of the People's Church. We're so glad you're here to worship and grow in God's Word together with our global church community. This week, we continue to dig deeper into God's heart of worship with Pastor Brett as he shares the words that God has put on his heart about what it means when it may be time for us to let go of something. Let's join in to find out more together. Well, as I mentioned, we've been looking at the heart of worship, and just as a refresher, the first occurrence of the word worship in the Old Testament is in Genesis chapter 22. It is the Hebrew word shaha. It literally means to bow before someone. But it's the context of 20, Genesis 22 that helps us understand the significance of that word. Abraham is called upon to offer up his one and only son, Isaac, the son of promise, his future, his legacy. And he bows under God's command, even when he doesn't understand what's on the other side of his obedience. And today, we're actually going to look at the life of Abraham and observe how a life of worship consists of learning to let go and let God. To let go of your desire for control and to let God lead you. To let go of your ways and discover his ways. To let go of your agenda and discover his agenda. To let go of your understanding as to how the world ought to work and let God teach you how he designed it to work. To let go of your identity and discover his. And we see this right at the outset of Abraham's calling. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, we read the following. The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now I'm going to refer to him as his more common name, Abraham. Abram and Abraham are the same person. What makes his calling so significant is what is happening in the chapter previous to that. In Genesis chapter 11... The people on earth are building a tower to their own great name in Babel. And God comes down and sees them building this tower to their own great name and scatters their body of work. You have to understand the ancient Near East mindset at the time. It was tribal in nature. You would have as big a family as you could, as many kids as you could. You would partner with like-minded tribes and build up your resources and do everything you could to protect it. That's the, what the world is doing in Genesis chapter 11. And in Genesis 12, God calls Abraham out of all that to leave the conventional wisdom of his day. And he's being called to let go and let God. He's being asked to let go of three things. Your country, your people, your family. Go from it. Let it go, leave it behind. Now those three things provide us a sense of identity and who we are in the world. And God calls him to leave it all behind. And I just want to take a few moments to look at how difficult that would be. I mean, God starts on the periphery of his life. Go from your country. What he's saying is, let go of your country, let go of your national identity. Now, there are over 200 countries in the world. In People's Church alone, there's over 123 different nationalities in our congregation. And I think all of us would agree that our national identity can be a strong and formative influence in our lives. We tend to appreciate our country of origin. 
It's food, it's customs, it's traditions, it's familiarity. I'm no different. I was born in Canada. I love our country. I grew up playing hockey and having Tim Hortons, and I engage in our cultural delights that we gift to the world, like maple syrup and beaver tails and poutine. Like, who doesn't love poutine? French fries with cheese curds and gravy? Of course that comes from Quebec because you need food like that to survive minus 40 for five months of the year. But our national identity can be a strong formation in our life. And we often feel that cultural shaping when we travel to different countries around the world. Whenever I arrive in a new country and Certain customs and traditions are foreign to me. It, it sometimes throws me, and sometimes even connecting with God in different contexts can be a challenge. And now when I travel to different regions of the world, I simply pray a prayer and say to God, I know you're here at work amongst your people. Help me to see it so that I can join you in it. Abraham is being called to let go of living from his national identity and discover God's identity. To hold loosely onto his nationalism and allow God to form something new in him. It's like God is saying, leave that way and I will show you a new way. God's not erasing his identity. In fact, God's gonna shape him and his descendants into a new nation, but it'll be a different nation than what we read about in Genesis 11. Instead of gathering and hoarding as many resources and building up an empire to our own great name, God is going to form a different kind of tribe, one that is interested in blessing all the peoples on the earth. You see, a life of worship yields its national identity to God's kingdom identity. It exchanges earthly values for heavenly ones. It doesn't allow its national identity to inform how it treats others from a different nation or tribe or language. It starts with the kingdom of heaven and subjects its national preferences to God's perspectives. And as we look around the world today and we see a world fractured in this space, we need to recapture that heart of worship, to be reminded that God calls us to be a blessing to the nations. This is actually a repeated theme throughout the scriptures. Peter Chu reminded, this, reminded us of this last week, looking at the story of Rahab. She was a Canaanite on the outside, but a worshiper of God on the inside. You see, her national identity gave way to her worship identity as God's activity unfolded in her life. And so God calls Abraham to leave his country, but then he presses into the next layer. Leave your people as well. He's being called to let go of his social relational identity. As you travel from nation to nation, you begin to realize that within each nation, there are distinct and different perspectives and people groups and social circles. We may be a citizen of a certain country, but then within that country, we belong to different subgroups or social structures. It was no different throughout the Old Testament, even with the nation of Israel. They were composed of 12 different tribes who descended from the patriarchs. And what we see throughout the Old Testament is while they were one nation, they had distinct perspectives and personalities according to their tribes. It's no different in our world today. There are limitless ways that we become tribal in our social structures. The social clubs we belong to, the economic circles we walk in, our political leanings, even our dietary choices can help us find a tribe that we belong to. And we can feel powerful and strong emotions attached to our different social groups. Sometimes we see these tribes clash in protests, whether it's climate change or political leanings or even conflicts that are happening around the world, we see these different social structures under one nation colliding together. And Abraham is being called to let go of that as well. Let go of your people. 
his social, his tribal identity, and allow God to shape something new within him. Now let's admit it, letting go isn't easy, especially when it conflicts with the layers of our identity. And when God calls us to love someone who might be from a different tribe or social group, it's even harder as he presses into that layer. We heard about that reality from one of our global partners when Wassam and Sophie were with us from Lebanon. He talked about the complexity of when the Syrian refugee crisis spilled over the Syrian border and Syrian refugees started to pour into Lebanon. They had previously been at war with each other and now the Syrians were looking for help. And Jesus was calling his body to love people across national lines, across tribal lines, across conflict lines, to love their enemies. And Wassam was very open about how difficult it was to go on that journey. But see, God's calling Abraham out of the ways of Babel into the ways of his kingdom. As we see the refugee reality showing up in our own city in unprecedented ways as there's an influx of refugees seeking asylum in Toronto, we can start to hold on to that Babel perspective. We can start to think, well, we don't have enough resources to care for people. And we start to exclude or differentiate and say, well, we need to hold on to what we have versus being open-handed and a blessing to the nations. In Genesis 11, they're building up empire. In Genesis 12, God is forming something new, but it comes into our own lives as well, and it's not easy. Now, God has gone two layers deep into Abraham's life, but then he goes right to the center. Leave your family. Leave those closest to you, those dearest to you, your lifeline, your certainty, your sense of identity and place within the world. You have to read this from an ancient Near East mindset. In Western society, we're very individualistic and we hold loosely sometimes to the significance of family structures in our lives. But in the ancient Near East, your family is everything. In fact, in the Middle East today and many parts throughout the world, they have a much higher respect for the sense of family and integrity and what that means. Your family shaped who you are in the world. It was your security, your ability to get employed, your significance, your retirement plan. Abraham is being called to let go of all of that in order to follow God's calling on his life. You see, Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldeans, and it was a culture, it was a people group that worshipped all kinds of false gods and gave themselves over to idolatry. And we learned from Acts and Joshua that it was actually difficult for Abraham to let go of all that. It was a journey, it was a process. He tried to bring his father with him, and they settled in Haran for a little while. And it wasn't until his father passed away that Abraham entered into the promises of God. Because God's calling him out of everything he knows and it was a process to learn to live into that. But God isn't calling him into a void or an abyss of nothingness. As we let go and let God, we experience his activity in our lives. Look at what he says to him in verse two. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. As we let go, we discover his I will. He's promising his presence, his protection, his provision. Walk with me and I'll make you into something. I'll bless you and provide for you and watch over you. Notice it's all about what God will do for Abraham not what Abraham will do for himself. I will bless you. I will make you a blessing to others. What you see in the rest of Abraham's story is that as he learns to let go and not rest on his own resources or ability, he discovers the I will of God, that God is faithful to his promises, amen? 
as he lets go of trying to work things out for his own life and his own future and his own security, as he lets go of all that, he discovers the provision of who God is, his promises delivered on. As he leaves his old life behind, the I will of God shows up in his life. You see, we experience the I will of God's activity in our lives as we let go. As we bow down and shaha and worship him, we experience his power, his presence, his provision. Now, this isn't a one-time lesson in the scriptures. The call to let go and let God is echoed throughout the scriptures. We see it in the life of Moses. He's called to let go of everything he knows and return back to Egypt, a place he didn't want to go back to. But as he lets go and returns to Egypt, he discovers God's power at work to deliver because God is faithful to his promises to him. And what we also observe throughout the Old Testament is that the call to let go and let God helps us see people differently. As mentioned earlier, Peter Chu reminded us of that. He talked about Salmon, who was one of the princes of Judah, who noticed the faith of Rahab. And he had to let go of his human categories that we place people within. Rahab was a Canaanite prostitute, but she was a worshiper of God. And as he noticed her worship life, he started to take interest in her, eventually marries her, and she becomes a part of the messianic line. Because he had to let go of the categories he placed people in and see that a worshiper can be from any tribe, nation, people, and language. That's a repeated lesson in the life of Elijah. Elijah had to let go of his own tribal groups in the northern tribes, his own people, and start to discover faith at the fringes of society. He had to let go of his own nation and people and discover that faith was growing, worship was growing in some of the foreigners that were around Israel. God helped him understand that a life of worship existed outside of the people of God known as Israel. And as he let go, he saw that the kingdom of heaven would be composed of every nation, tribe, people, and language. The call to let go and let God echoes right throughout the Old Testament, right on into the New Testament. You get to the New Testament and God clothes himself with humanity, steps down into the human condition in the person of Jesus, and Jesus is constantly reminding people to let go and let God because when you get to the New Testament, life had become pretty concrete again. Social structures and whether you were in or out of the kingdom were hard drawn lines and Jesus comes along and he's befriending the stranger. He's welcoming the foreigner. He's healing those who are outside of the covenant. And he calls out to humanity and to his disciples to let go and let God. He walks to every citizen under heaven and says to them, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and I will teach you what God is like. All you who are weary of a world put into categories. All of you who are weary of the divisions. All of you who are heavy laden by the brokenness of sin and the ghetto of groupings that sin places us in. Come to me, learn from me, and I will teach you, I will help you learn to let go of that old way and discover the very heart of God help you to let go of your way and discover his way, to leave your strength and discover his strength, to let go of your power and ability and discover his power and ability. You see, Jesus brings us into a new kingdom, a new nation, a new family, a new identity altogether. He grafts us into the activity of God and makes us into a new creation that brings blessing to the world. He continues and fulfills the calling of Abraham. Jesus radically redefines our definition of family in Matthew chapter 12. His mother and brothers come looking for him and he's told while he's teaching others that his mother and brother are outside looking for him. And Jesus expands our aperture of who's in the family of his when he responds to that statement. In Matthew 12, verse 48, when told his family's looking for him, he says to the person who's come to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? 
pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You see, when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we belong to a new family, amen? God becomes our father and we become citizens of heaven. So while I'm a Canadian citizen, that is secondary to the reality that I am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, amen? Amen. And we live from our heavenly citizenship first and we subject our national identity, our cultural identity, even our personal identity to what Christ is forming in us. A new tribe, a new people who will bring blessing to the world around it. Abraham steps into the beginnings of that story. Steps into the beginning of God creating a new tribe, a new people who will bring blessing to the nations. And as he lets go and lets God be at work in his life, he discovers discovers that we live by his power, his strength, and that he will provide, he will protect, he will watch over his people. Let me close with one last observation in Abraham's story, and it's this. You are never too old to let go and let God. And what you see through the rest of his story is an elderly gentleman with his elderly wife learning to live into the fullness of all that God has for him because he learns to let go of his way his desires to control everything, and he lives into the goodness of a God who works on his behalf. And the invitation of God to let go and let him be at work in your life stands as long as you're breathing. You see, God's not so much interested in where you've been, but where you're headed. He's not so much concerned about your past, but your future. And he invites all people to come to him and be a part of what he's doing to bless the nations. He doesn't need your ability or your know-how. He simply requires your obedience and your shaha, your bowing down to his will and work in your life. And as you study the rest of the life of Abraham and countless others throughout Scripture, as they let go and let God, they discover that they become a part of a much better story because a life of worship bows and yields in loving adoration to the heart of a heavenly Father who wants to bring blessing to the nations. That's what it means to get back to that heart of worship. Let's pray. Father, we want to live in the stream of your activity to be a blessing to the nations. Lord, help us to let go of our nation, our perspectives, even our personal struggles that stand opposed to all that you have for us. Thank you that you invite us into relationship, into a new family, into a new body that we are one in Christ and in a world that desperately needs to see that love and unity. Would you work that into us, both locally in our lives throughout the city and globally in the lives of our partners? Thank you for your activity in our lives and the way you shape this in us. In Jesus' name, amen. If your hands are free, put them together with us. Come on. And let's sing. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome Consider all the worlds I am to 
Thanks for joining us today. We encourage you to visit livingtruth.ca to access more resources and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay connected and up to date on all our latest teaching and worship videos. We look forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday.